And we are dedicated as a center, not just as a gallery space, but as a center to feminist arts, past, obviously, present, and future. And our mission is to raise awareness of feminism's cultural contributions and to educate a whole new generation of people about the meaning of feminist art and to maintain in this space a very dynamic and welcoming learning center and uh, to present feminism in, I think the museum likes to feel an approachable way. I've never quite understood the need to say that because I think feminists and feminisms having to do with equality is very approachable, but in any event, here we are. And what it uh, allows us to do and allows me to do is to invite visitors, writers, um, artists, cultural and social critics and scholars in to provide lectures uh, for an audience uh, such as yourselves. And it is really wonderful that Professor Lauren Rakin has joined us today to um, speak on his gender, women and gender in Jewish thought and art. And it's part of an ongoing series, and this is actually the first program of the autumn uh, season, if you will. And next weekend, there is, by the way, in the back, a brochure which has programming up through December, and I think you'll be very excited by a lot of uh, what is going to be available here. Um, next weekend, Groundswell Community Mural Project is coming to do a panel discussion. And uh, they're discussing voices heard. I don't know how many of you live here in Brooklyn, but you may have seen some very beautiful large murals on the sides of buildings. And these are the product of a most incredible organization that was begun by a young woman named Amy Samaman and it's called Groundswell Community Mural Project. And the young women who come not only learn about art and the creation of public space and information, but actually do an enormous amount of research and discussion, library work. So it's a full uh, educational opportunity for people who are really mostly from disadvantaged areas and it has been enormously successful. Uh, I think they've done almost 200 murals uh, in Brooklyn. And so they will be coming here to, um, to talk to us about that uh, on the 28th. That'll be Saturday. On the 28th, there's a panel discussion called The American Hero and The American Dream. I like to think of it also hero and sheroes, but it's academics, journalists, and comedians explore the ways in which the two presidential candidates have been framed by the media. Now, I need to add that this little blurb was written uh, before the Republican National Convention. So I suspect that this is going to be a really rousing thing. And I, th you know, uh, panel discussion, it is uh, including um, an associate professor of culture and, culture and communications uh, Charlton McKillen at N from NYU, and also leading women's activist, best-selling author and commentator, Gloria Felt, who also has been very involved with uh, Planned Parenthood for a number of years, and producer of The Daily Show, Raim Hadyat. It is going to be, the panel was assembled and moderated by a very brilliant young woman whom perhaps Professor Rakin knows, Courtney Martin. And she's the author, she's young, and she's, she's overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly uh, effective and brilliant. I think she actually received a MacArthur. Um, my wonderful assistant, who I consider to be quite brilliant and wonderful, said to me, this can make one feel like you haven't done anything by the time you've reached 28. <laughs> She has recently written, Courtney Martin has um, published a book called Perfect Girls, Starving Daughters, The Frightening New Nor Normalcy of Hating Your Body. And Courtney has uh, been honored with the Ari um, Ellie Wiesel Prize in Ethics, the Joan Cook Scholarship from the Journalism and Women's Symposium, and uh, she is also 
been a Woodhull Feather and she, Fellow, and she's part of the first class of Progressive Women's Voices, which is a project at the Women's Media Center. This young woman has not reached the ripe old age yet of 30. She has a BA from Barnard, but she says in her bio, it's quite lovely, that she has an MA from Gallatin uh, School at NYU, which is, of course, the, the home of our today's speaker. She says, in writing and social change, and then she puts in parentheses, yes, this really exists. <laughs> she writes that, and it's wonderful um, to hear her say that and also to acknowledge that the reason that exists is because of our wonderful Lauren Reagan. And he has, over the years, over the last decade almost, has graciously and very generously invited me every semester to come and speak to his master's class in social transformation. And it's always, uh, it's always an honor, but it's always a pleasure. And uh, so it's very, it's very happy moment for me to be able to welcome Lauren Reagan into my home to speak to us today. And I'd like to read to you a little bit about Lauren. He's a sociologist of art and cultural historian. He's a founding member of the Gallatin faculty and the founder and current chair of Gallatin Interdisciplinary Arts Programs. His teaching and research interests include sociology and political economy of the arts, arts management and cultural policy, arts community and social change, Native American studies and the relationship between Kabbalah and art, and activist in the social world, Professor Reagan, was founder and president of the Foundation for the Community of Artists, and he worked in various government positions in arts and cultural policy. Um, the list is very long and incredibly impressive, and instead of taking all the time, unless there's something that you feel particularly strongly that I'd let everybody know, he did graduate um, uh, with Phi Beta Cap from Brandeis University, which maybe feels to him like a long time ago, but I suspect when we all think about the way time is going, it feels like yesterday. So without further ado, and a great pleasure for me to introduce to you Lauren Reagan and to welcome him and thank him very much for giving us his time. Thank you all so much for coming this afternoon. And uh, I have a, a few introductory words. First, I would like to uh, say good afternoon and to thank Elizabeth, my, to thank my friends and colleagues. And I hope you know how much your friendship and the dialogues over the years have guided me and led me to the doors of research and speculation that have brought me here today. And hopefully, and hopefully to continue this work into the future. I want to thank my teachers, especially Leo Bronstein, and I'll be talking about Leo Bronstein a good deal this afternoon. And I just mentioned, because Elizabeth mentioned Elie Wiesel, that Elie Wiesel uh, wrote a little critique and review of some of the material that I'm going to present today, and he thought very, very highly of Leo. Leo Bronstein during his lifetime. I want to thank, thank my dear friend Michael Dinwiddie, uh, uh, Josephine DeCaro, and all of you here today. I want to thank, particularly thank Elizabeth Sackler for giving me this wonderful opportunity this afternoon. And I want to thank my former student, good friend, and research collaborator, collaborator who's here this afternoon helping me out, Christina Kim Yang. Okay. I hope that you will indulge me today and be tolerant of some very controversial things I hope to present. Uh, what I am undertaking this afternoon is a probe, an introduction, a brief overview of a vast field of many interrelated realms, an investigation, an experience, a study which deserves a lifetime, many lifetimes. I will talk about Kabbalah, art, Shekhinah, the female image, the feminine, and the, and, and the feminist in Jewish imagery and art, past and present, 
its hiddenness, its emergence, its reemergence, and new evocations. Why it has been or may have been hidden, why it, it is going through a rebirth, and hopefully these last two questions I will also ask for your help in beginning to answer. If I am lucky or blessed, I will try to jump from ascent to ascent, from small hill to small hill, lightly, to begin to illuminate what is already woven in reality and to reaffirm what the scholar anthropologist Gregory Bateson has called the pattern which connects. In this brief discussion, I cannot prove or fully demonstrate the depth and deeply rooted long-time connections that I'll try to present. All of these are quasi-speculations, but I believe if we follow some of these leads, we will come upon the depth, the deep rootedness, and the long-term existence of some of these connections. And for what end do I hope to show these connections? I hope that it will be an affirmation that one dimensionality in art and gender was never necessary, should never have been a social imposition, has been, is being overcome given the nature of a universe that Kabbalah had understood since at least the 1100s in Provence in southern France. That the imposition of a sole limited view of what would be allowed in the imagery of Jewish art and of women's art and of feminist art should never have been the case. That even the past, despite its overwhelming patriarchal suppressions and subordination, always went against a long-term view of being, and that such oppressions need not and cannot ever be the case again. I want to uh, explain a teeny bit about the handout that you've received, and I have a few more if uh, someone is here that hasn't gotten it yet. Uh, this, as I said earlier, is for you to engage in later because it's, uh, it's dark in the room, it's too complicated. The, the, I'm gonna present a couple of thousand years of enormously complicated material and go over it with enormous brevity, to, which, is, which is radically unfair. But I'm trying to just touch, taste some of these possibilities and connections for you. And there's much reading and, and, and further work. There's enough material here for my lifetime, many, many lifetimes. So the first side of the page is of the uh, Sefirot of, of Kabbalah. And I'll talk a little bit of what the Sefirot are with some comments of my print alongside that you'll see. And this, the back page is a series of definitions of uh, the Sefirot uh, from a scholarly text. The next page is a what Leo Bronstein, one of my great teachers, calls the history of ideas through the visual. And this is something else I hope you'll look at later. And on the back of that page, uh, further of, more of his ideas concerning moments of seeing and certain principles. Third page starts with Proverbs 31, an excellent wife who can find, who can find, for her worth is far more than jewels, with some notion of who may have written it, and the last page, which I would have loved to have time, but we won't have time today to discuss, is the extraordinary revelations of 20th century physics into the 21st century, even now, most recent discoveries, which in physics parallel the story of creation told by Kabbalah since, since the 11th century, and particularly since 1280, when the Zohar, the major text of Kabbalah was written, to see, as I said, well, you can read it, read it later, because it, it has to do with the unbelievably surprising uh, parallels between Kabbalah's notion of creation and the Big Bang. Uh, and by the way, uh, although I've been looking into this myself, a uh, wonderful, brilliant scholar who has the Pritzker Prize to translate all the works related to Kabbalah and Zohar, Daniel Matt, out in San Francisco, has written this very special book called God and the Big Bang. Okay. First, I want to speak about the ubiquitous goddess. And uh, perhaps we can have the first slide there. So you can see, I'll be talking mostly about Asherah. I'll be talking mostly about the general issue of the goddess. But you can see some examples of early Canaanite goddesses from the Middle East who were incorporated, believe it or not, although we're not often taught this, incorporated into 
of Jewish worship. Goddesses are ubiquitous. This, in a nutshell, is the conclusion that one reaches from a perusal of the voluminous and still growing literature on the history of religion. The earliest, the earliest role of the goddess, therefore, was that of the numinous mother who endowed her worshipers with her own mysterious qualities. It was out of the body of the primordial goddess that the world egg emerged, or that the earth was born, or alternately, it was the goddess body itself that provided the material from which the earth was made. The workings of the goddess archetype can be traced in rites, myths, and symbols throughout history, as well as in the dreams, the fantasies, and creative works of both the sound and the sick of our own day. Among the biblical Hebrews, there were powerful, attractive religious trends in which the worship of the goddess played an important role. The female deity of the early Judaic monarchic period did not disappear over time, but underwent many transformations and succeeded in changed form to retain much of their old sway over religious sentiments through a great deal of history, particularly down to the very end of the Hebrew monarchy, the worship of the goddess played an integral role in the religion of the Hebrews. The prophetic denunciations of these idols, and we can look at the next two, which is Asherah, this is Astarte, now again Astarte, the next uh, Asherah. The, the prophetic denunciations of these idols had very little effect on practice. The, devo the, the devotees of the goddesses could not be swayed to give them up and to concentrate instead exclusively on the worship of a male god. There can be no doubt that the goddess to whom the Hebrews clung with such tenacity down to the days of Josiah was a Hebrew goddess. She survived and underwent astounding metamorphosis. She manifested herself later as the female cherub and later became the manifestation of God's presence, the Shekhinah. She also assumed the form of a divine queen and bride who joined the people every Friday at dusk to bring them joy and happiness on the sacred Sabbath. I think she is strongly re-emerging and re-emerged in the new presence and popularity of Kabbalah and the world of the Jewish artist, male and particularly female. And I would say as an underlying foundation to all of this that I, although I don't think this has been much discussed or written about, that I think the reemergence and popularity of Kabbalah only took place because of the birth of the, of the second and third phases of the women's movement and of, and of feminist thought, experience, and practice. The beginnings of the period we are dealing with here go back to the time following the arrival of the Israeli, Israelite tribes in Canaan. For about six centuries thereafter, that is to say down to the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC, the Hebrews worshiped Asherah. Shekinah is thus, if not by character, then by function and position, a direct heir to such ancient Hebrew goddesses of Canaanite origins as Asherah and Anath. Shekinah, who I will, the, female presence of God who I'll discuss throughout this afternoon's talk is a Hebrew abstract noun derived from the biblical verb shachan and meant and means literally the act of dwelling. Now I also want to give an example of this and briefly discuss the goddess as she made her appearance in the Dura Europis synagogue. Excavations conducted in northern Syria unearthed the remains of the town of Dura Europis. This was, and we could move on to the next, okay, and th this is another example of uh, early work. Some, sometimes, this, this, and I mentioned this, sometimes this was discussed as potentially, still under debate, as a column from uh, Solomon's temple, and the goddess appears in different segments of this pillar. And next, please. Okay, I'm going to keep this for a while. Uh, this town of Dura Europis was a Roman frontier post for about a century. And in 256 AD, or the, 
in the common era, it fell to the advancing Persians. Up against the town's protective walls stood a synagogue. An inscription found in the synagogue itself gives the date of its construction to 245 AD. One of the largest and most elaborate murals flanking the ark from the left and having the rescue of the infant Moses, as you see there, uh, is centered upon the naked figure of a woman. The Dura discoveries thus occasioned not only a correction in the traditional view of the Jewish historical attitude on, represent on representational art, it had to be, no, go, go on from there. Who then is this goddess figure? Into who, whose arms the muralist placed the infant Moses? Our answer, based upon a great deal of material, which I don't have time to go into today, but I'll mention just briefly, our answer is that she was the Shekhinah. And by the way, I don't know if, if we, if that spelling is there, it's S-H-E-K-H-I-N-A. This conclusion that the goddess is Shekhinah, startling though it may seem initially, can be supported by numerous considerations. And one of the main ones is that the Midrash establishes a very close connection between Moses and the Shekhinah. In fact, no other human was represented as having such an intimate relationship with the Shekhinah as Moses. In the, in the desert sanctuary, excuse me, the desert sanctuary, this gives you a little bit more understanding of what Shekhinah means. The desert sanctuary of the Israelites was called Mishkan, or dwelling, because Yahweh was believed to have dwelt, that is, Shachan, in it or over it in a cloud. It is this idea of the dwelling, Shekhinah, the dwelling of Yahweh, that in time developed into the concept of Shekhinah as the dwelling or presence of God as a separate feminine divine entity. The nude woman in the Moses mural is shown raising her right arm over the ark. This is how, with a kind of ingenious simplicity, the artist illustrates the mystical concept of Shekhinah hovering over the tabernacle. Already, excuse me, I don't need that. I'm trying to, I've, I've been working to uh, edit down this so that I can cover a great deal of material jumping around over time. What ultimately emerges from this is that contrary to the generally held view, the religion of the Hebrews and the Jews was never without at least a hint of the feminine in its God concept, and I know that's extraordinarily uh, controversial. I want to next discuss what has been called uh, in the recent literature of the past decade or so, Jewish and iconism, in other words, anti, against icons and imagery. An, A-N, iconism, refers to the historical myth that certain cultures, usually monotheistic or primitively pure cultures, have no images at all, or no, no figurative imagery, or no images of the, of the deity. Jewish an iconism implies that the Jews are a people of the book, and not a people of the image. And proponents of Jewish and iconism deny the existence of authentic Jewish traditions in painting, sculpture, and architecture. They claim that Jewish attitudes towards visuality and the visual arts range from indifference to suspicion all the way towards hostility. Paradoxically, when speaking about this hostility, I'm speaking primarily of the late 19th and much of the 20th century and the 20th century attitudes. Earlier, in, medieval, in the medieval period, the attitudes were much more open and did not overinterpret the second commandment. It appeared that Jewish icon, an iconism, hostility toward the image, crystallized simultaneously with the construction of modern Jewish identities. Empirical evidence indicates the existence of authentic Jewish art throughout history. So why would Jewish aniconism have persisted so tenaciously throughout the 20th century, or so much of it? Ironically, this Jewish aniconism turns out to have been the partisan opinion 
of anti-Semites who disparage Jewish culture and certain diasporan Jews in Western Europe and America who refused to acknowledge this existence. And iconism eventually became the complete conventional wisdom for general scholars, art critics, art historians, historians in general, who were unable to overcome the dogmatic lessons of their education. So this, I think the quite extraordinary scholar and author of a book called The Artless Jew, a gentleman named Kalman Bland, B-L-A-N-D, correlated the modern perception of Jewish art with anti-Semitism and with the struggle for Jewish identity rather than the vague appeal to an externally or eternally fixed Hebraic spirit or any ancient biblical prohibitions against fashioning images of God. In fact, as icon an iconism never acknowledged, the prohibition against imagery in the second commandment and against iconography is really only against one image, and that is God. For instance, an example of the anti-Semitism, in the composer Wagner's opinion, Jewish aesthetics amounted nothing to nothing more than historic Byzantine Judaic Oriental notions of profitability. This Jewish focus on profitability, said Wagner, has ruined the free-spirited art of ancient Greece and Western Europe. In 1850, Wagner substituted modern German culture for the dictumized ancient Greeks, and he added biological inferiority to the list of Jewish socioeconomic defects, and he issued a racist, scathing attack against Judaism and art, objecting to and calling it the Jewification of modern art. Wagner and the anti-Semites had claimed that Jews were unable to produce genuine art steeped in any kind of communal awareness of divine mythic beauty because Jews were forever yoked, quote, in insidious commercialism. Supported by modern and postmodern philosophy, the denial of Jewish art achieved unimpeachable status in 20th century American thought. Even without the help of philosophy, the notion was enshrined in textbooks in and in museums up until today with the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Almost ineradicable, the denial of Jewish art was certified by countless international authorities from across disciplines. Intellectuals who deny Jewish art were supposed to have known better. For as early as 1897, the British author David Kaufman had urged the scientific world to renounce this fable and at last to succumb to the overwhelming evidence of facts and documents, but that many succumb to an iconism is obvious. Jewish an iconism therefore became to the world a self-evident certainty. The most scrupulous writers and the most conscientious editors at the most demanding presses and particularly university presses took Jewish an iconism for granted. So there are three little elements that I've just briefly introduced, <clears throat> and now I want to go into perhaps the most complicated and difficult part, which I hope uh, you will listen to as a poem and not as a typical discursive uh, presentation. I'm going to introduce this with fragments from a forward written, uh, this was actually forward to uh, Leo Bronstein's book, uh, Space in Persian Painting, an Introduction to Islamic Art, because the scholar I'm going to talk about now, Leo Bronstein, who I'd like to tell you the story at the end in the question discussion period, how he came upon ultimately writing about the relationship between Kabbalah and art. But this is a, a, a few quotes from former professor, I mean, Professor Talat Said Haman, who at the time he wrote this was chairman of the Department of Middle Eastern and Near Eastern Studies at my university, New York University. 
Talat Halman was also the uh, Secretary of Culture on the cabinet of the Turkish government, the founder of a new university today in Ankara in his retirement, and a poet and novelist. Uh, Talat Halman wrote, once in a while, a remarkable intellect erupts on the scene to transform the substance, the strategy, and the entire style, style of art history or criticism. Leo Bronstein, who died in 1976, stands as a paragon of a visionary critique of the creative process. Few art historians surveyed and wrote about a broader range of topics than did Bronstein, from Greece to Japan, from Spain to Iran. One could think of him as the Marco Polo of art history in the vast geographic areas he roamed. The way Bronstein looked and saw and showed is unique, revolutionary, millenarian. He viewed art poetically and wrote about it passionately and prophetically. He gazed, embraced, interacted, joined, took active part, coalesced. He became an integral part of the creative act, visually, emotionally, passionately. In this, he was probably the greatest and the ultimate romantic. Perhaps the term epiphany best summarizes the, imp the impact of his poetic wisdom on the visual arts. Significantly, Leo Bronstein himself, and I'll often refer to him as Leo, the French uh, pronunciation of Leo, in this book calls his search for the essence of artistic truth, calls it adventures. In another book, which is one of my favorites, which I had republished re recently, is titled Fragments of Life, Metaphysics, and Art. Leo's divine eyes captured its quintessence as few others have ever been able to do. He was an, an extraordinary intellect and spirit dedicated to the discovery and the reinvention of art. The Talmud says, where there is the book, there is no sword. Imagine, please, try to feel when I offer you these fragments, this fragmented dance from Leo Bronstein's book, the last book he wrote, before he died, called Kabbalah and Art, imagine that I am reading from a poem rather than a, a proof. Leo begins by telling us that ancient wisdom's invention is that everything, oddly, is nothing, has nothing in it, for without this nothing, everything would not be anything. Leo wrote, and isn't it true that the way great human historical collectives or tiny human creative individuals compose their productive and distributive deeds, their exchanges and changes, their life. This is the very way that they compose their way of seeing, their way of hearing, touching, creating things, their art. And in developed, what he calls braided cultures and arts, we find the, a multiple oneness, a plenitude, a continuum, the woman via man, the man via woman. And this is true also in the tradition of East Indian art. You could look at the Siva temples, the Elephanta caves. My teacher, Leo Bronstein, from the depths of his childhood, developed a grasp from having had a presentiment as a child that beyond or beneath any object which emerges suddenly and very ancient and erotic, that there he might begin to try to seize his certitude of the possibility or the potential of infinity. Leo once wrote, the elemental spot of our innermost self, we call it sensation, and I have some material that you can look at later in, the, in one of the handouts. Sensation or the immediate direct reflex of flesh, body, and mind's awakening. It is unseizable because it is unretainable in experience as a presence, unretainable. It is infinity because ironically, infinity becomes exhaustible in the very attempt to seize it physically. Sensation, therefore, being immediate, is always lost. It can be retained or approximately reconstructed by an approximate semblance, by the meditative activity of our memory. And then, once memory comes in, sensation transforms into impression. But human beings, in our freedom, and perhaps in our folly, choose to possess 
or seize the unseizable wholeness, the thatness of a sensation, the unseizable totality, the, by the power, by our spontaneous arbitrary choice of a substitution, what Leo called a substitution testimony. And we try to do this in an object or any possible or immediately witnessing object. So in art, this substitution testimony is the choice for the un substitution for the unseizable totality, the choice of this flower, this broken line, this geometry of a configuration, this sound, this smell, this visual touch, obviously this any uh, artifact, this any object of art. But another way, this is substitution, but another way, Leo says, is open to us, and he calls this impression. This he calls the way of correspondence, of solidarity, an added sense through the use of the memory of sensation, and he calls this correspondence. Correspondence that is a continuation into the world outside, not a break with the world and the need to substitute it by a fragment of that totality, but a continuation of that which is remembered, reconstructed then as an imp impression, a memory. Impression is always a form of correspondence, a continuing into the world. And what we call naturalism in art is always more or less an impressionism, an, impress, an impression correspondence. But we human beings, we want certainty. We want the actual presence. We want as close as we can get. In fact, no, we want certitude. That is, we want total identity with a present sensation. Identity, this Total identity with the immediate sensation, Leo says, it is folly because it's impossible. Because sensation as immediate total presence is impossible. It can't last. The minute you start to think, I want this sensation to last, you're already in the realm of impression and memory and restatement. But nevertheless, human beings want this identity and the impossible and the unseizable, come what may, at almost any price, at almost any risk. This is our humanity's essential, Leo calls, metaphysical despair, but it's also the source of creativity. Sensation and idea are re reversible. Uh, the only lecture we have ever recorded, because Leo wouldn't allow himself to be videotaped, he, he only, we only have one tape from 1952, uh, in an old when uh, an old, obviously old tape recorder, where he tried to elucidate, and someday I hope to edit this tape and, and, and publish it, elucidate the possibility of the intertranslatability of the visual and the verbal. And he says, sensation and idea, the visual and the verbal, are reversible in the depth of what he calls our visual labor. The entire poetry of our world, visible and invisible as yet, is there in the depths of our visual labor. All the meaning of beauty, therefore, of meditation, thought, and history is there. Leo Bronstein discovered, and this is a story I might tell afterwards, a similarity, a relationship between his lifelong ideas about art and Kabbalah. Both contain what he calls minds, two ways of search and penetration. The way that leads to the immediacy of touch and the way that leads to the mediacy of concept. For Leo, in relationship to art, Kabbalah is the transfer of the world of medieval sacred, what he calls cosmogenies, that is theories of creation, the transfer of that medieval world of sacred theories of creation into our world of profane ways of knowing, profane epist epistemologies. So he, he read an enormous amount of Jewish thought, the legalistic, halakhic, traditional, Hasidic, and he focused in, in a way upon the uh, creation written by Isaac Luria what, from 1534 to 1572 in Sfat in, in Israel today, what is called the Lurianic, L-U-R-I-A-N-I-C, the Lurianic Kabbalah. And he looks at the Luriana Kabbalah's concept of Ein, E-Y-N dash Sof, Ein Sof. Ein Sof means infinity. He looked at Ein Sof's act of manifestation, not as expansion,
but as in the Hebrew, Hebrew word, by the way, all the original Kabbalah uh, uh, writings, Zohar, were written in Aramaic, and they were written first in southern France and Provence, but mostly, fascinatingly enough, in Spain. Uh, uh, so so what, what occurs is what we call tzimtzum, Z-I-M-Z-U-M. That is a contradiction, excuse me, a contraction, a concealment, creation's mysterious instantaneity of contraction and of growth and then of achievement. Kabbalah's great absolute, that is Ein Sof, infinity, is the unseizable totality which is totally transferred and thus, and thus partially seized into the act the primeval first act, the never growing but ever growing, you see these uh, unexplicable mysteries, the never growing but ever growing, never achieved but forever achieved, act of infinity's self-contraction, that is the act of tzimtzum, an act of divine contraction that preceded all emanation, that preceded all creation, that preceded that preceded infinity's self-reduction to the infinitesimal point. And the concept contains the even more daring doctrine of the cause and effect even of, prime, of primeval era. It was Leo's interpretation, which is sometimes argued, that there is no such thing in Jewish thought as sin or original sin. There is error which can be redeemed. The error that Kabbalah explains is in the very act of creation, but in Kabbalah is also the modalities of cor correcting and redeeming this era. And this era, the primeval man's era, is, according to Leo's interpretation of Kabbalah, the primeval era is of not yet being, as Ein Sof is, both simultaneously male and female male via female, and female via male. And then simultaneously with this act, simultaneously with this act of creation, the second act of creation, out of nothing, unfolds. When the light of, is manifested, the light of Tzimtzum is manifested itself, and the light's radiation and weight becomes a, a new kind of corporeality, a new weightiness, and so that the recipients of this light, the vessels called kilim, K-I-L-I-M, broke, some of them broke under the pressure of the weight of light. So that then there is the third and last act of this simultaneous drama in Isaac Luria's vision. It is the vision of tikkun, sometimes spelled T-I-K-K-U-N or T-I-Q-Q-U-N. Tikkun means the redemption of the primeval era, error. The sin was that of separation. Rather, the error was that of separation. The error was that of discontinuity and of disruption. For Kabbalah's vision of possibility, even of necessity, was to be part of a dynamic continuum of man via woman, of woman via man. So tikkun, the Reparate, the, the, the repair, the redemption, can be achieved by the loyalty to the origins, that is, the loyalty to the presence, the presence within, particularly within any righteous person or righteous persons, the withinness of Shekhinah. So, Leo says, with the West, Western Europe, the United States, in the 19th and 20th century, begins a kind of self-liberation and a new dignity begins to develop to what Leo, using the ancient Greek word, calls techne. That is, the new capacity to think not just, not only with concepts in the mind, but to think as the artist thinks with the body. This new thinking with the body rose up to meet the already the advanced development in Western culture of thinking with the mind. So that, Leo says, for Jewish people and for Jewish artists, the creation, there was a creation of a new, what he calls the simultaneity of touch, smell, taste, vision, pose, abstraction in painting and sculpture, dancing, and their equalization, all this body creating art, and their equalization with, which, with what had already achieved a great ascent in Western thought, that is scientific thinking. 
And so this new body touch language began to be exuberantly achieved at the start of the 20th century. In this way, the, Arc, the American, mostly Chicago-based, but there's a building on uh, Bleecker Street uh, between Broadway and Lafayette Street of the late great architect Louis Sullivan. Louis Sullivan gave a good example of this when he spoke of the dignity of human thinking via the body as, quote, the ten-fingered grasp of reality. So Leo feels that Kabbalah touched Western culture, and Kabbalah believed in the concreteness, the fleshiness of abstraction. This also seems to emerge in the thought and art, which I'll discuss in a moment, of a Picasso, Leo thought, of a Jean Miro and a Paul Clay. The idea in these artists and in Kabbalah that cosmos is equated with mind is pure creation. This thought and this art were joined by the thought and art that created soul with the interaction and the continuum of male-female, with a balance of judgment and mercy, of judgment via mercy and mercy via judgment. So Leo Bronstein found these two orientations joined along with a moral imperative that gave birth and energy to the Jewish 20th century artists, such as Chaim Soutin, there we go, and, 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 and Leo said of Chaim Soutin that his painting is all of this soul structure, painted in harmonies, distortions, and plenitudes. So Leo found this in the work of 20th century Jewish artists, such as Chaim Soutin, Max Weber, Jack Levine, Ben Shahn, Mark Chagall, Jacques Lipschitz, and Sir Jacob Epstein, and many others who are still coming in this sudden flowering, particularly women artists. From Gershom Sholem, the great scholar of Jewish thought and Jewish mysticism, and his editing, translation and editing of Zohar, which is translated as the Book of Splendor, basic readings from the Kabbalah, we learn, quote, and this is from the Kabbalah, when one, when a person is one, when this is said of a human being, when he is, when he is or she is one, they are only one when male is together with female, and thus, when they're together, highly sanctified. Leo asks, through which underground channels came the possible Judaic influence on our West, on uh, the presence? How did the presence, Shekinah, in Leo's mind, uh, come into uh, the daring imagery of the West? And so now I want to find, if I can find, yes. Uh, I, want to, I, I, don't have, I don't have this, unfortunately, on, uh, on, the, on the PowerPoint, but, and I didn't make enough copies, but please pass these three examples around so you can at least take a quick look at it. The first example I'm going to discuss is Picasso's La Danse de, de Fandery. So if I pass one around here, I can pass it back. of his understanding of, of one of the elements of Kabbalah. Leo speaks of the daring imagery of Kabbalah and the daring imagery of Picasso's La Danse des Banderies, where he says the great initial event here is the cosmic creation, and a graceful woman hovers, pouring into the male the seed of creation and procreation, she, according to Leo, this female figure, which he interprets as Shekinah, and this is why I say <clears throat> the presentation is very controversial, but think of it poetically, that she holds Picasso's whole secret. And here Picasso's whole secret, Leo says, is similar to Kabbalah. Unity comes, oneness comes only through the man via woman, <clears throat> the woman via man, through light and through light as presence of the Shekhinah. I need what happened to the water. Thank you. Thank you. For the man, Leo, Picasso, the philosopher, the poet of art, the artist, 
there's a certitude of infinity brought him, and this certitude of infinity brought him into contact with the secret woman, the secret woman who is plenitude, who is the return, who is the rebirth, who is the redemption, rede redemption without redeemer, the woman, the soul, spirit, in Hebrew, neshama, the light, all included in the understanding of Shekhinah, the indwelling. And Zohar continues and says, it behooves a man to be male and female, and it is she, Shekhinah, the female, it is who obtains for the male heavenly union, without whom, without her, there is no heavenly union. And the only stability that we can find in life, the only aspiration, Kabbalah says, is the balance between man and woman, a oneness. So Leo felt, saw, he touched that in this union, a very ancient, very majestic, very ancestral feeling emerges from this oneness of man via woman, woman via man. And this he called the presence of tendresse, using the French word, the presence of tenderness. He imagines, for instance, in the scene that's written about of the betrothal, of the betrothal, of the embrace, of the union, of the, of the night of their marriage between Besht, the Baal Shem Tov, who was the founder of Hasidism, and his wife-to-be, his wife, Hana, that Hana, this is Leo's interpretation of this betrothal scene, that Hana, in the embrace, in the union, sees tenderness. Thereby, she sees the secret woman, thus present at the creation, the creation ex nihilo, from nothing, the creation of man, of the world, of mind, of woman. And this creation, this sensation, this seeing on Hannah's part was the poignant recognition of tenderness. And this notion of tenderness is at the core of Leo's lifelong theory of all art. But he finds this also, he sees it in Kabbalah. And for Leo, his understanding of language and of living action is seen in what could be described if I had this on a whiteboard, blackboard, as an interconnecting aesthetic continuum which connects in, 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 in a way that we use as dash between tenderness, solitude, solidarity of human beings, and Shekhinah, all of one continuum. And he calls her the secret woman, Shekhinah, remains still to this day the most mysterious and central image word in Judaism. Here, I want to offer a brief reprise of Kabbalah's view of creation, which is uncannily similar to the theory of Big Bang in advanced physics. We are, in the, in the, before creation, we are at the beginning, before the beginning of the beginning. We are behind what, what in Hebrew is called tehiru, T-E-H-I-R-U, behind the vacated space, the vacated space point where Tzimtzum takes all that might have existed in, in this language, in God's universe, and contracts it to a point, into the nothingness. It's infinity's withdrawal into itself. This is Kabbalah, and this is also physics. It withdraws infinity into a no-thingness, and then emerges the memory of a pure existing presence. There comes the first spark, and the first spark is also interpreted as the innermost woman, Shekhinah. It continues into the visionary world of image via touch, uh, the conceptual world, image of, of correspondence, and beyond both the perfect, what Leo calls the perfect finite circle, which I think you'll see in some of the later slides we'll show, the finite circle which represents humans' correspondence and solitude with the cosmos, and the never-ending, final, multi-directed, continuing line, and, and, and Leo calls this uh, the human solidarity with the cosmos. And he says, again, to repeat, that immediate sensation is unseizable. The unseizable is hidden in infinity, in Ein Sof. Now, what I handed out, one of the first um, uh, uh, handouts, is the, uh, 
pictures of the sefirot. The sefirot, as I think I've also, that's also there in that footnote, uh, I think it's on the first, the sefirot imagery is on the first page, and the se second page is uh, the, the definitions. These are the metaphysical numerations of the divine aspects. Sefirot are the divine aspects and the principal keys in Kabbalah to the mysteries of life, universe, and the world. They form a tenfold hierarchy, and their names are enumerated from the highest downward and from downward upward. So you have there, just as an example, Kether at the top, which is the crown, and Kether, K-E-T-H-E-R, in its pure and absolute essence, has no aspects. It is the eternal, mysterious reality. Thus, the Kabbalah calls Kether in itself Ayin, A-Y-I-N, nothingness, non-being, or super-being, non-cause of all causes, no end, infinity. In the origin stories of both Kabbalah and Leo's theories of art, through his experience of solitude and solidarity with the world, there is ultimately an experience of a union, self, and soul that Leo calls, as I mentioned, tenderness. For Leo, tenderness is the last, the tenth sephirot. Tenth sephirot, which is called, as you see in the second page, sephira malkuth. The tenth sephirot contains all the sephirot. And sephir, sephira malkuth, the tenth, produces and circles and penetrates all the entirety of all creation. And it is she, it is she in, in the end that joins the beginning, the mother, the presence, Shekhinah. Malkuth, the tenth sephirah, is the secret woman. It is, it is Shekhinah's home. And Shekhinah contains, Shekhinah contains tenderness, tendress, that makes man via woman, woman via man, that makes judgment bend towards mercy and binds and balances them into uh, judgment via mercy and mercy via judgment. Down and via this path is again tenderness, is the moral imperative, the spirit made body, is Shekhinah. And Leo Bronstein writes, art is the shelter of justice. Art is the point, the spark hidden in the rock, the finite circle and the never finished line of Kabbalah's meditation, and the finite circle and the never finished line in Paul Clay's spark, in the drawing that he created, Paul Clay, the noted European artist, called The Formation of the Black Arrow. And this is a drawing, this is Paul Clay's drawing, of the formation of the black arrow that Leo interprets. An almost literal Leo notes in this drawing of Paul Clay almost a literal Kabbalah expression of descent on behalf of the ascent that is from itself to itself, from nothingness to nothingness, where Ion has created the opposition and correspondence of two directions, of two curves, more tension, more tension, more white in the drawing, more of its opposite, more black, till the resulting final mixture of, a two, of two opposed about-to-be bodies, the tense white, the tense black, culminate in the full bodiness of a new, a first thing, the first thing of creation, the black arrow. This is Clay, Paul Clay's primeval infinity substituting point, the tzimtzum, the withdrawal, the root of all roots, of all his manifestations, the concentrated and manifested universe of discourse in Clay's line, in his color, in his meaning, in his imagery. So Leo wrote at one time, as an example of this substitution process, a painter paints what she or he does not paint. That what a painting wants to say, its beauty, its truth, its goodness, is not expressed merely in the conduct of a line, that is the story that the line would tell in relationship to other elements in the painting, 
or the structure of the color the, that is the promise of a painting's narrative. An artist does not paint its deeper meaning in the narrative itself, in the material or technical elements. And I have this written on, this, I think, the fourth page of your handout. The meaning of the work is in the very line itself. Leo speaks of the what level, which is the storytelling of the, of the, uh, of the, the painting, the how level, which is the technical material. Then he speaks of the what of the how which is the deeper inner meaning or style told in the very essence meaning of the style. And, and Leo then refers to, that is, that the line itself, the color itself, the composition itself has the meaning. What he calls, as I said, the what level, the what of the how level. I know it sounds a little silly, but Think about it and repeat it to yourself, the what of the how. And Leo recalls the philosopher mathematician Bertrand Russell, who when speaking about the work of Ludwig Wittgenstein, the great 20th century philosopher, Russell says every language, every human language has a structure concerning which in that language itself, and it cannot say what it wants to say. So there is another language which has a new structure. And to this continuous creation invention, when a language cannot say what it wants to say in its own language about a reality or about its meaning, we discover immediately, or hopefully immediately, that there's another language that can say. And when that language becomes inadequate, there's yet another language on into infinity. That is, the loss or the non-presence of something in one language, and I don't mean verbal language, I mean any language of, that we human beings have created, any artistic language, any movement, any tool language, any technical language. When there is a loss or a non-presence of something in one language, it is transferred and present in still yet another language and a new awareness. Almost done with this part, so. Into every artist, within every artist, transferred from the what level, the narrative story, the, in, into, the con, into the how level, the, that is the technical material, the transfer level, we learn the what of the how level. It's, this is the artist's secret, the what of the how level. It's their central obsession, their secret presence, their substitution for the unseizable totality. And Leo calls this substitution their metaphysical tenderness. That is, in all art, he says, is the secret woman. Unbeknownst maybe to the artist, exists the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah in you, in me, in everyone's creation out of nothing. It is the secret of poetry, for instance, examples. It is the birth of the dark pearl in Rembrandt's painting, of the miraculous birth of a porcelain in the earlier Goya, the birth of the rainbow in Renoir, the birth of the white in Winslow Homer's Waves and of the red in Thomas Aikens. It is the simple, banal, and ponderous weight in Cezanne's substitution for infinity when he constantly paints and repaints Mont Saint Victoire. And then all of a sudden, Leo recalls the phrase in French, L'art ne s'élargit pas. Il se résume. Translation, art is not expansion, it is reduction. Leo says immediately, it's, it's reduction, that's tsum tsum, reduction to the infinite smallness. And then Leo asks, who said this? Why, it happens to have been Edgar Degas, the rabid professional hater of Jews, who always remained ignorant of the Jews he despised. And Leo says, despite himself, this realist painter of Parisian scenes, his little ballet dancers, his bathing women, his portraits of women, he too, Leo says, was a painter, unbeknownst to himself, of the secret, silent, invisible presence. One example, and I'm sorry, I don't have this, but I'll refer to the painting. You can look it up sometime. Uh, from, he says, Leo says, what Degas is doing from reduction to reduction 
from transfer to transfer, they got concealed and manifested, painted another presence, painted what he calls the invisible yet corporeal presence of an astral body in his paintings, a body surrounding a painted living being, an aura of a person's action. So for instance, there's a painting of the young woman in a millinery shop trying on a hat. The young woman is facing a mirror. You see her face in the mirror, and the mirror is nothingness. It doesn't exist. It's flat. It's a reduction. It is something else. It's an absence. Leo calls it, in her presence, she is concealed, reduced. Okay. So now, in concluding this section, Degas, the Jew hater, was despite his conscious hatred, a painter of the Jewish mystical vision of creation out of nothing, creation through the act of reduction, the mystery of what Kabbalah says of Tzim Tzum. La ne se lagi pa, il se resume. Art is not expansion, it is contraction, it is reduction, the theory, the ideas of Kabbalah. For Leo, Degas, even Degas, by painting this off-centered act of Kabbalah's pr primeval divine era and its redemption and its correction, how, Leo says, did Degas correct the primal era? Leo says, by the will of tendresse, which is in the very line, tendresse, which is in the very color structure, there, there in the color and line structure, he painted his secret, the secret tenderness, the metaphysical woman, the Shekhinah. And I'd like to conclude this little section with a little quote from, from Goethe's The Tragedy of Faust. Goethe wrote, all of mere transient date, as symbol showeth, here the inadequate to fullness groweth. Here the ineffable wrought is in love, the ever womanly draws us above. Okay, now into my last section of this talk, which will bring on some of the slides. Okay, let me, without dropping this. Just as I'm moving into a new element here, jumping, uh, we can show, move, move to the next slide, please. I just wanted to show, as part of Jewish art, which we can talk about later or at another time, how works of various 20th century, mid 20th century Jewish artists begin to include actual elements that come uh, that are symbolic or direct symbols from Kabbalah. And this is Adolf Gottlieb, The Enchanted Ones. Next is Mark Rothko's Untitled, and, the, and I'm here not to talk about men's art, but uh, Barnett Newman's one mint, all of this with direct reference, and it is known that um, uh, uh, Gottlieb, uh, Rothko, and Newman particularly did know about, and the last one of Newman's, uh, this is uh, the name, number two. I was once, uh, I, I, by the way, I mentioned in parentheses, one of the reasons I'm so delighted to be here this afternoon is because when I was an infant, my mother used to bring me here teething on a little crust of rye bread to see my father's paintings, which were exhibited, God knows when, in the early 40s in the community galleries in here in the Brooklyn Museum. So one time I was riding up an, escalate, uh, an elevator in the Fuller Building to an exhibition of um, Hans Hoffmann's paintings, and Hans Hoffmann was my father's painting teacher, and we were riding up in the elevator, and who gets on the elevator but this extraordinarily awesomely tall man and a man of average height next to him. And who was it? The tall man was the critic and writer Harold Rosenberg, enormously impressive. And next to him, dressed in a three-piece business suit with a nice gray mustache and a strong presence, was Barnett Newman. And what indeed were they talking about? The relationship in Barney Newman's art, as Harold said, of Jewish mystical tradition. So I want to show in, the, in, this, in this emptiness, I am nothingness, is related to that. Next slide, please. And the last slide of any male that I want to show is Jacques Lipschitz, Mother and Child. I wanted to show this because this work, 
which might be the most bittersweet of all responses to the Holocaust anywhere and by any artist, Lipchitz, mother and child. In this sculpture, the woman who is missing her hands carries a child on her back. The work exists in several versions, but its most poignant to be in the presence of is the one on, on the grounds of the Israel Museum located on one of the hills of Jerusalem. When one looks at that sculpture in that location, I can imagine a voice saying softly, I have been maimed, I have been bloodied, but I am here. I am in Israel. I am of Israel, and I am carrying the future generations within me. Okay, next, please. This is a work that represents, it says, Rubies and Rebels, Jewish female identity in contemporary British art. It also included uh, some uh, uh, American art, and the exhibition was dedicated to the memory of the artist Sandra Fisher, the wife of uh, the distinguished artist Kitaj. Okay, so I want to show a few examples of the work. Next, please. This, again, again showing that the an iconism that was accepted throughout all of art history, history in Jewish life and non-Jewish life, did not recognize, even in the 20th century, this 20th century work of uh, Jewish women's art of themselves. Here's a self-portrait, Hannah Gluck. Okay, next, please. Uh, this is particularly interesting, Jane Logeman's Kaddish, because here you have broken into the multitude of letters the Hebrew prayer for the dead, which is only a prayer. It doesn't mention death in this prayer, as you know. It mentions only praise of, of the existence of universe and of God. One of the reasons this is so interested, interesting and connected to Kabbalah, because something I didn't, of course, have time to discuss in Kabbalah at all, is that Kabbalah is deeply engaged in the numerical representation of letters. And through both the interpretation of the meaning of letters themselves and of the numerical representations, it is that's one of the ways in which they reinterpret the Torah. In, order, in other words, Torah is at one level, and the deeper level says Kabbalah, all the writers of Kabbalah from Spain, from France to Spain, to Israel, to Sfat, to Jerusalem, is through the, uh, through the vision and ideas of, of creation, through Kabbalah's notion, by interpreting the words. And it's often said that every single Hebrew letter has embedded in it someplace the tiny Yud, that letter Yud, standing for the Holy, the Almighty, of Yahweh, God, the Infinite, etc. Ein, inf Ein Sof, that is in infinity. Okay, next slide, please. Here, uh, Gillian Singer's Untitled 1996 has a multitude of imagery, many of which directly refer to the Ten Sephirot, embody the Ten Sephirot, Sephirot and beyond in multiple interpretations and imagery of the Sephirot in Kabbalah. Next, please. Here, uh, Carol Berman's, uh, you, you know, one would hope in a certain way I would that you'd see the, the man via woman, the woman via man, but I think there's the implication of this in the multiplicity of both bodies and certainly for Jewish art, this is an example of the lack of fear of presenting the body itself and of the expression of meaning through what, what Lewis Sullivan calls the ten-fingered grasp of reality, the capacity of, of Jewish art, particularly in this case, Jewish women's art, which I would call feminist art, expression of these multiple meanings, also referenced through Kabbalah and Shekhinah. Here, Angela Baum's uh, uh, Rachel, for me, is a visual presentation of the very act of creation, of Ein Sof, of infinity, creating through uh, its reduction and withdrawal into the single point, then the explosion of the Big Bang creating the universe. My interpretation, it's the way I feel it, the way I see it, and uh, my, what have you. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, here, Kitty Claydman, its uh, an initial reading is that of her memories of the attic in which she and her family hid away during the Holocaust. But it also represents through the explosion and the encapsulation, the encapsulation and the explosion of light, for me, not only survival through the Holocaust, but creation. Next, uh, Alice 
look Kahana's Jacob's Ladder. Of course, Jacob's Ladder is one of the most extraordinary and well-known uh, uh, imagery, visual, uh, verbal imagery from the Bible here, interpreted by this Jewish woman artist in this marvelous visual, which is, for me, the steps ascending from, from Sephira Malkuth, from Shekinah, uh, to, to top and bottom, the constant uh, uh, creation from, from, from Sephirot Malkuth to Kether, the crown. And there can be no crown unless in the, in, in the so-called lowest Sephirot, Sephir, which contains all the other Sephirots, in order to give them the energy through the woman, through the mother, to emerge back to the ascent to the crown. Uh, uh, next, uh, Lillian Legion's My Body, Myself. Uh, to me, this is to me an example of the capacity to return without fear and to uh, emphasize and uh, uh, manifest the capacity of the body in its different forms. And here, one might say, isn't there restriction through the wires, through the spines? But to me, the, rather than uh, being the wounding, but wounding is also connected to redemption and healing and recreation, there is particularly th through the head the, the notion of birth and emergence and of creation in my understanding of this. Finally, next, Susan Schwab's creation. And there is a great deal to say about Susan Schwab. Let me just um, uh, refer back to a moment to uh, Claydman's work which you saw earlier, and you don't have to see it. It was the attic imagery and the light. Uh, such works fall on the border between the representational and the abstract, and they exist between, and this is something that when, when Kabbalah speaks about uh, judgment through mercy and mercy through judgment, is also speaking about uh, the process of, with mercy and tenderness, the process of healing the pain of the past. Uh, one other, ne next slide, I want to, now Susan Schwab here. Susan Schwab was born in 1944, and she has, and implies that uh, different ongoing questions about Jewish art. Her concern about creating Jewish art, women's Jewish art within a non-Jewish world. And she has a series of triptychs using the traditional Christian Catholic modality of the triptych that she calls creation. Here, she's inspired by the opening images of that most famous medieval Jewish illuminated manuscript, which is the 14th century Sarajevo Haggadah. Her creation has been revisioned in the abstract geometry, which is so close and an in-depth part of Kabbalah, of, of, of Ayan, of, excuse me, of Ein Sof, infinity. She discusses the notion of infinity in the modalities and moods of the circles, of the moons. That is, she says that they are without beginning and without end. And the image of God is not presented, is not represented, but sun, moon, and earth are clearly rendered in the same circular form of creation. Certain of Schwab's work add to the arc circle configuration of the downward pointing triangle with vertical lines from mid base to apex. This symbol, this symbol of femaleness is traceable all the way back to the Hebrew gods, god, goddesses, Astarte, Asherah, and others. It is the role of the artistic creatrix, so long suppressed for women, is now in her work and other Jewish women artists restored in the very textures of the silver point surfaces she works with. And the watery wave-like lines of her silver point surfaces within the luminescent, luminescent frames recall for her the verbal and visual images of the primordial water mother goddesses of ancient, of ancient Hebrew thought. And finally, amongst the issues raised by Jewish American women artists in the last few decades has been the question, where do I, as a female artist, fit into Judaism and the images that are part of Judaism's history? 
Scores of American women artists since the early 1980s have wrestled with the question of where and how, as women, they fit into the Jewish tradition and the tradition and the artistic tradition. Some, like the Israeli artist, who I don't have a um, slide of, Helene Eilon and Carol Hanoi, excuse me, Hamoy, have created installations, particularly in the 1990s, rather than paintings and sculptures. And what they have created is new versions, new reimagining, imagining from a feminist perspective of Torah scrolls, prayer books, talitot, the material elementals of Jewish spirituality are used and transformed from their feminist perspective. Many have contributed to the development of a new ritual ob object, a new, or new ritual universe, as in Judy Chicago's dinner party, so magnificently exhibited outside this door, which, in, re, which reintroduces, particularly they've created something called the Miriam Goblet, which reintroduces the sister of Moses and Aaron to the Passover table, side by side with the cup of Elijah. And that is all that I have to say about this. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry if I went so long. I don't know if we have any time for questions, a few comments. Elizabeth says we do. Maybe put the... I mean, I apologize for going so rapidly over so much material, but I wanted at least to give you a kind of poetic jump dance taste of what, is, what I've just started to look at, and I hope to have the time to look at it for a long time. Frank Menusen. Right, right, right. And then to look at the Moab and David, you have intertwined triangles. And Robert Mapplethorpe just said that the triangle is the base of creation. And they have two intertwining. And like a male and a female triangle. Uh, and then you have this, the counting, the, numer the numericals, if you count with the, the six triangles, it comes to 18, which is the, the number known as life or high, that in the triangle, Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Against the male and female yeah. connected to create life. Here. Yes, I agree very much so. And Leo would say from Kabbalah that the point, any point of the triangle was uh, the, the process of tzimtzum reduction of, of Ein Sof, which is infinity, to that point, and only through the reduction to the point. And this is exactly, I mean, this sounds, does this sound peculiar? Does this sound... Uh, uh, from another dimension. It is the notion of reduction to the point that is the basic theory in, in not only uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, the general theory of relativity, it's in the special theory of relativity, it's in quantum physics, and it's even now in the new notion of string theory, that the reduction to the, to the smallest possible point is the, uh, of, of infinity's reduction is the only possibility thereby of of the Big Bang, the explosion, the creation. So there in the triangle is the point leading out to the creation of the endless growing universe. Dina. Why do, perhaps we answer, perhaps not, why do Hasidim did the learning of Kabbalah until they attained a certain age and a certain okay. amount of learning? Okay. Well, there are two things I'd like to say about the Hasidic and Hasidic. My son was Hasidic. Yeah, about relation. In the beginning of the early years of, of, of Hasidut, of Hasidic experience, the, the early teachers, uh, all the er, early holy men, the, the, the Rebs, uh, were particularly, pointedly, focally trying to create a popular access of and for Kabbalah to their people. It's only in the more contemporary period of time when, this is not an answer to your question, but it's one element of Hasidism, where they have more or less turned their back on aspects of this and become, in my mind, let's say, much more structured, in some ways perhaps slightly rigid. But it was a traditional notion that within Kabbalah, because of these um, challenging, uh, 
massively controversial ideas, particularly of the, that most central idea of Shekinah, the female, God as, as female, of male in, in, including female, female including man, but having a, a, a female nu, uh, numeration and nomination name that it would be so threatening and, and, and potentially dangerous that one had to achieve a certain maturity, which obviously now, in order to begin this study, obviously now it's completely uh, beyond all of this, but I, I think uh, there's obviously now a, a totally new Las Vegasization or Hollywoodization of Kabbalah, but there's also, I think on the whole, a very serious study of this. Leo did it through the arts, I'm trying to continue to do it through the arts, and women's art, it's only the beginning of a, of a whole, the rest of my lifelong study. Uh, uh, but as I said earlier, this popularization, I think, could only have happened with the feminist movement. It, the, the, the idea that there is now openness, license, and capacity to look in this realm uh, is, is, is available to us because of uh, feminism in general movement and in the arts. Yes, please. Well, as a feminist artist, I have found it so fascinating Thank you. that I No, I know and that. The idea of contract, I mean, in order to create something, you know, it has to, it has to become very, very you, you, it's, it's like a, a, a turning inward to a small point and then a, a manifesting outward. And you know, something I, I had absolutely no time to do. There are, there are multiple Kabbalahs, all emerge, coming from the original Zohar written in Spain between 1280 and 1284. In, I forget the name of the town, um, same town, same city in Mexico, uh, Guadalajara, Spain. Um, uh, there's, there's also, you come across quite frequently books that all of my references are Kabbalah with a K, which is the traditional uh, uh, translation from the Aramaic to the Hebrew to the English. Then there you see books and, and discussion Kabbalah from the sea. That is the Christian reinterpretation and version of Kabbalah. Now Kabbalah, you know, you say, how does this man say, how did Leo say, how do I say, that there's this undercurrent that brings Shekhinah into the 19th, late 19th, 20th century Western and American world. I mean, isn't that a little far-fetched? What's that underground stream? Well, there wasn't an underground stream. Starting with the initial creation of the earliest books and writings uh, in in France, mostly in Spain, in the Mediterranean, and then into Judea, Israel, uh, in Sfat, in the 16th century on, uh, noted Christian, Catholic, particularly scholars, Renaissance humanists, became totally in, engaged in, in the reading and study in the original languages. Pico della Morandola, pronounce it properly, uh, was a great Kabbalah scholar, and ma many others uh, since then, scientists, uh, 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 philosophers, uh, humanists, what have you. Uh, it, uh, the, uh, uh, when I asked Daniel Matt, the great contemporary translator through the Pritzker Fund, where are the, where the, are the most, uh, you know, you know um, uh, what's a, uh, special or unique copies of the Zohar, he said most of them are owned by the Vatican. And you can see them in the Vatican Library. So this is not something that is so arcane or esoteric or non-present. It's openly present for those who have wanted to look for it. Any other comments or questions, please? Let me thank you so much for, for attending. Thank you so much, Lauren. This was just, this was really outstanding. And I'd like to invite you as you continue to refine and reflect 
to come back Thank again, you. perhaps next year, and do a second part Thank to you. this, Thank because I think much. it's extremely, extremely yeah. important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, I hope you have an opportunity to enjoy the dinner party. The Gada Amer show, Gada is an Egyptian-born yeah, uh, feminist yeah, artist, wonderful. is going to be up only for another two weeks. We open on October 31st, an exhibition called Burning Down the House, Creating a Feminist Art Collection, which will be a group show of some very famous and wonderful feminist artists. So please join us for that. And also, uh, we have Women Votes, which is a marvelous exhibition in the Herstory Gallery. And we have some wonderful pieces there of uh, memorabilia during the suffragist movement. And I think you'll enjoy that. That's going to be up until January. And then after that, we will have an exhibition based on the fertile goddess plate of the dinner party. And that, I think, could tie in again Wonderful. next spring to some more of uh, some additional thinking that, that Lauren Rakin may have for us. Thank you all Thank for you joining so us. Thank it was you. really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really, I appreciate so much being here.